Today's guest has come out of prison the last few weeks. It's not often we say that about somebody appearing here on Downstream. He was on remand in a prison in London. Initially, it was Wandsworth, and he went to Pentonville in North London because he gave a speech, and that was considered to be conspiracy to commit a public nuisance, just giving a speech. Now, you might not have heard his name, but you certainly will have heard of some of the organisations he helped set up, from Extinction Rebellion to Just Stop Oil. He's one of the most influential climate activists out there. And he has some really devastating and insightful views around what will happen to our society over the next coming decades and what has to be done if we want to avoid billions of deaths. Some call it hyperbolic. He would say, if anything, he's making a conservative understatement. Roger Hallam, you were the co-founder of Extinction Rebellion. You have been involved in protest groups like Animal Rebellion, Insulate Britain, and Just Stop Oil. Where'd your politics come from? Well, as a farmer for 20 years, so I wasn't really involved in politics for a long time. I was involved in social anarchist type activities when I was a teenager and the peace movement. And then I got into creating social alternatives, as they were called at, the, at that time like housing co-ops and workers' co-ops. And then... And that was while you were a farmer or before? That was before I was a farmer. When I was 29, I became a commercial farmer and did that for about 20 years. And then it, the weather started going peculiar. And so I lost lots of money. So I decided to come back into the fray. Why did you become a commercial farmer? Often that's something that people do because their parents did it. It's not like a thing you do in your mid to late 20s. I like growing veg. <laughs> <laughs> And where, where did that come from? Did Don't your, know. Were your parents? Yeah, my of... parents. Had, my dad had a garden and stuff. But, I mean, yeah, it just appears, doesn't it? Sometimes you do things which you like. And that's what I liked. I mean, politically speaking, my take for what it's worth is by the late 90s, most people had given up on the social agenda because of neoliberalism. And I was fed up of you know, knocking my head against the wall. So I thought I'd go off and do something I enjoy. So I did. So the late 1990s, you become a farmer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'd grown veg before then, but yeah. But I, I think, you know, my personal story is that in 2006, it started raining every day for seven weeks. So I had about 30 people working with me on the farm and they all lost their jobs because we lost hundreds of thousands of pounds and a lot of businesses went out of business that that year and then it was rained every day for seven weeks the following summer and then that winter I think it was minus 15 for a fortnight so we lost all our winter crops so by that time although I knew what carbon was doing to the weather um, I knew it was over why did you know it was over? I mean, somebody might say that's just anomalous weather. And that's, that's as old as time immemorial. It's yeah. just a couple of years, right? Well, you don't want to ask me that question, do you? I don't think that. <laughs> no, but somebody, a, a critic or sceptic would say, well, look, you, and it's a, it's a logical argument. Well, you're just talking about two years. I mean, people, farmers have had bad weather events forever. So what, why do you think that had ch was evidence of something changing permanently? Which I'm not disputing broadly, but I, I w wonder why that's evidence of it. I think it was obvious that things were changing permanently by 2006. And if you hadn't worked that out, then you're very bad at basic maths. And I, you think, th was I think that the, the issue isn't working out the, whether this crisis is happening. The issue is experiencing it viscerally so that you actually emotionally realise the catastrophe that we now got locked in. I suppose the problem for me is the selective evidence of it. So for instance, you have people like Nigel Farage and it'll be March and it's snowing and they say, hold on, I thought the planet was meant to be getting warmer. And so I suppose I wonder how useful it is to sort of pick one or two years when realistically we're talking about processes which are decades, centuries, millennia. Or am I wrong? Was it was it that obvious and stark to you? Well, one of the things we can talk about, Aaron, <laughs> yeah. is how people change. 
Yes, so as you, as you know, because I met you there, didn't I? Or did I? Shortly afterwards, anyway. We, we, we knew each other, didn't we? We met a long time ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago at King's College. It's before you were this fam- infamous <laughs> world-renowned activist. <laughs> well, as, as I probably told you at the time, or I should have told you at the time, right? You know, it became pretty obvious early in my field research. And I'm not claiming to have discovered anything unique, by the way, which is that Social change is a function of emotional confrontation. It's not a function of facts. Obviously, some people need to know some. You need to know broadly that carbon's destroying civilization. But once you've got the general gist, you're not going to engage in social struggle unless unless there's some sort of emotional arousal. And that means, you know, some evangelical talk or seeing people getting beaten up or seeing things on telly which make you cry, your relative goes to prison, all that sort of stuff. So if various right-wing politicians pretend that they don't understand what's going on, that's the last of my worries. (laughs) Do you think think they're being disingenuous? Do you think they're lying? Do you think even somebody like Nigel Farage acts, you know, he's... Somebody might be watching this and disagree, but he's not stupid. You know, he can read a chart, he can look at something going up, he can see that concentrations of CO2 are leading to rising temperatures. Do you think he believes what he's saying on things like climate change? Well, he interviewed me once. Okay. So I thought it was quite nice. He's very, yeah, he's quite affable, but that's, that's the strange thing. Affable. affable people can argue very, uh, very bad my things. Take, my take on it for what it's worth is that he's not really interested in the truth. Is that what he's interested in is creating an effect. It's like he's a postmodernist in that sense. And um, and if he's creating an effect and that feeds his ego and his sense of identity, then he'll carry on pursuing that line of approach. I mean, people aren't actually that interested in the truth. It, that's an enlightenment myth, which we can talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that? Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm talking you empirically. Say, you, you say people. I mean... Okay, so do you think, this is a very direct question responding to that, do you think that the normal person is more interested in the truth than media figures and personalities like Nigel Farage? Or is it just, no, they actually reflect the public more broadly? Well, the first thing to say is the normal distribution curve. So there's lots of people who are very interested in the truth and there's lots of people that have zero interest in the truth. But the centre of the normal distribution on people is people, people are primarily interested in meaning and people want to be loved and they want to give love. And if they can't give love and they can't receive love, then they become either self-destructive or they become externally destructive. In other words, if we're going to think concretely about how we're going to get out of this enormous mess, we have to go back to fundamentals and we have to re-interrogate what we think human beings are and how they tick. And on the basis of that, then we can design social spaces where people will feel empowered and connected, and then they'll move into social struggle. But you have to get your ducks in a row philosophically first. So let's get our ducks in a row. So you're making a a broader point about human nature, which I don't necessarily disagree with. But I would say also, hold on, look at discussions around climate change in this country, in the United States, look at how they've been particularly crafted by conservative media outlets, conservative political figures. That's quite distinct, for instance, from how climate change is discussed in in continental Europe. Now, there are still climate deniers in places like Italy, Spain, France, Germany. Of course there are. But it seems to me somebody like Rupert Murdoch, for instance, has had an outsized influence on the debate, quote unquote the debate, when it comes to climate change in English-speaking countries. I mean, that's a bit different to the sort of generalising point you're making about human nature, or am I actually looking at the wrong thing here? Well, what you're looking at isn't that important, no. <laughs> so you don't think Rupert Murdoch, for instance, in the, in the debate around climate change in, in English-speaking countries isn't particularly... Well, well, first of all, let's... It would have been let, Let's go back to a few fundamentals, right? Climate change was a very sophisticated um, product of a very sophisticated analysis by corporate PR people in the 1990s when they refashioned this crisis in terms of a technical phrase, the climate and change. What we're dealing with is nothing to do with the climate, and it's certainly not looking at change. What we're dealing with is a social project project by the global elites to have billions of people die in order to maintain their power. In other words, it's a subset of class struggle, and it needs to be seen 
as a subset of a wider narrative that's been going on, you know, since the Industrial Revolution and arguably for before that. So as soon as you as soon as you introduce the word climate change, like everyone turns off because they think it's something technical and it's something reformist and it's something that you need to leave to the experts. And your friend here said just before we opened up, said people want to hear about climate change, but then they don't listen to it. So I'm not going to be talking about climate. I'm not going to use those words because those words are like intrinsically insulting to the billions of people that are going to die uh, if nothing dramatic changes over the next 20 years. What people, what people, what we need to talk about is the process of oppression and the process of genocide and how that happens historically and how it's been replicated in this last chapter of humanity that we face potentially. Just to clarify for our audience, you were previously speaking to our producer Jonah, who's a, a big a big person and downstream, though he's the, you know one of the <laughs> some of the talent behind the scenes. And we've got Tony here too. Um and, and he said to you something about, you know, environmentalism and environmentalists. And you said, I don't consider myself an environmentalist. And you were you were pushing back really against the kind of the cornerstone phrases in regards to this whole debate. You just mentioned climate change there. I just also want to probe something you said, which was that this was a social project by global elites. To me, and I know, I know you're not saying this, to me that sounds like um, you're saying that it's a intentional effort to kill billions of people rather than a certain subset of people, which I agree, it's, not, it's an appendage to the class struggle, um, not being willing to see profits fall, have a more equal distribution of, of, of wealth in the world. But it sounds to me almost like you're saying it's intentional on their behalf that billions will die as a result of climate warming, etc., well, we, we have to interrogate what the word intention means because it can mean various different things. So it's quite a sophisticated like analysis is required, in, in my view, in the sense that I could want to kill you because I don't like you because you're Aaron, right? Or I could want to have you die because you're in the way of me wanting your possessions and your land. So... I intend to have you die in both circumstances, but it's the latter one that the global elites are engaged in. In other words, it's not like the Nazis saying you're a Jew and I'm killing you because you're a Jew. It's more like... You're not saying that. No, I'm not saying yeah. that, right? But what I am saying is, is the Serbs are in the way in the Ukraine, so we'd have to kill 30 million of them. It's not like we don't like Serbs, not Serbs, Slavs rather, you know, like with Hitler's living space project, as you as you may know, the plan was to kill 30 million Slavs in World War II. They didn't kill the Slavs particularly because they didn't like them. They killed them because they were in the way of an economic supremacist imperialist mm. scheme. The Labour's so, realm. Yes. Yeah. So what what does an approximate uh, similarity there, and note my word, approximate similarity there, between the global elites saying, we want to maintain our profits, and in order to maintain our profits, we are prepared for billions of people to die in order to maintain that power and that prestige. I mean, that does seem incredibly hyperbolic to me, because I, I think it is fair to say that the global elites are happy for billions to die. Not happy. They would view it as an unfortunate um, externality. This is what the capitalist class has always done, right? Sure, they're, but that's, not, that's very different they're to not, saying... They're not saying they want, you know, labourers in Manchester in 1850 to die at the age of 35. Yeah, they would say they're it's an unfortunate it's, consequence. It's an unfortunate consequence yeah. of an ideology of extraction and, and economic growth. But that's not the same as go invading a country like um, the Third Reich did with the Soviet Russia and taking what was modern day Ukraine and, and saying, look, this will be the breadbasket of a future greater Germany, a greater Reich. I mean, that's a, I, I, I you know, because we, look, we're talking just, uh, what, one or two weeks after Gary Lineker made this point about 1930s Germany and UK migration policy. I, I, I don't understand why so many people got outraged about it. And I thought John Barnes' explanation was really superb about it, actually. And, and, and people are welcome to talk about those things. But sometimes these analogies hinder more than they help, don't they? Saying comparing it to Lebensraum in Ukraine. No, no, no. I think it's absolutely essential to use comparisons between the Nazi period, broadly defined, and and the present day. And you know, in so much as you want to talk about this, I think I think 
no disrespect to your generation. Please, no. <laughs> when, I was a t- when I was a teenager, um, in the 1970s and 1980s, and certainly in the 1960s as well, the comparison between the Nazi period and present day injustices was widespread. It was ubiquitous. And the reason for that was because, because the, general, the general moral tale of our culture at that time was never again. In other words, what went on in the Nazi period, broadly defined, must never happen again. And over our dead bodies, will it happen again? That was the lesson of World War II. And so that became embedded in radical and left culture uh, during those decades. And it was massively effective. For instance, like I was involved in the peace movement as a teenager, and the phrase was nuclear holocaust. No one had a problem with that. Oh no! I think the word the word Holocaust. Um, it's been applied, for instance, to what happened in Democratic Republic of Congo. There's a great book about the American ho- uh, Holocaust and what yeah, happens with Spanish the, Holocaust, late, yeah, uh, late uh, Victorian Holocaust. Look, exactly, but, but, exactly, but, Mike Davis. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not probing the use of a word. I, I think no. me policing the use of a word is, is pointless. I think generally it's pointless. What, what, I'm, what, I'm probing yes, the, 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 the utility. Uh, I'm not trying to. By the way, I'm the, not. The, the, I'm the, let me just say this because uh, I'm just to be clear. I'm not saying how dare you. I'm not. I'm not moralizing. Mm. I'm just asking the use and the efficacy of doing this. How's it useful? How is it useful is it makes serious, it makes morally serious the, the, um, the obscenity of what's going on. So, so how is what's going on right now similar to what happened in Ukraine after 1939, 40, 41? How is it similar? Because there's an ideology of power and an ideology of extraction and an ideology of genocide and that those ideologies have been prevalent but forget the ideologies. Yes, well, that's the sub- starting sub- point, sub- right? Sub- sub- substantially. That's, that's, that's the starting sure, point, but, well, right? If you well, it's point- important for us to understand, right, the Western civilization is not, hasn't been a benign, like, influence upon world development. Oh, look, right. you're talking to the right guy there, Roger. Yes. I know that. Yes. But, but I'm saying when you but, use that language... But that's the root. Oh, sure. well, that's we'll, the root of what we need to talk about. We'll return to that. The root of what, we're to- the root of what we need to talk about is not... We've got some problems with putting CO2 into the atmosphere. CO2 is the mach- mechanism of annihilation, right? There's no more point talking about CO2 as, as there is talking about gas or, or um, you know, pits to throw people into. But why not? I mean, but the, because the, the, the that's, CO2 is the thing that makes the climate warmer. No, 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 no. Of course it's not. That's the, that's the tool of, of, the, of the murder project. No one talks about the tool. People talk about the murderer. This is like a fundamental paradigmic shift in how we need to talk about what's happening. But hold on, hold on. The solution to this, let's say Roger Hallam all of a sudden becomes world god emperor, (laughs) we would stop putting CO2 into the atmosphere. So I find that a rather strange thing to say. That's not... Who's we in that sentence? Well, well, the world that's subordinated to the you know the will of God Emperor Roger Hallam. We would stop putting CO two in the no, atmosphere no, no. because it would not lead no, to no. less climate no. warming. The we is a, is a, a, a bourgeois frame, isn't it? Is it? Yes, Why? because what it assumes is that we're all together in society. We're not. We're part of a. Why cl- is it a bourgeois frame? Because it creates the illusion that we're all in this together. Well, it can do that, but I don't think it necessarily does that. Well, it substantially does because it, it prevents the creation of a confrontation, right, between, it's te- a technocratic phrase, right? It says, this is, this is what the liberal climate movement has been saying all along, and one of the reasons it's catastrophically failed is because it's not identifying the actual culprits, which is the global elite. And it, has, it hasn't framed the struggle in terms of a political, social phenomenon. I entirely agree with you. But why would that preclude we? You, if you're saying us and them, that us is like a, it's a synonym for we, surely. Yes, but when it's used in a liberal context or a general right. context, okay. as you just did, yeah. then it creates the idea that we're all, we're all doing this together, which is self-evident when we're not, right? Let's talk about the failures of the liberal environmental movement. Where do we start? Why has why and it has clearly failed, right? Do you think that's by design? Do you think it was ever meant to succeed? Well, let's remember carbon emissions have gone up by sixty percent since the first COP, and no COP has prevented carbon emissions. It was ninety two, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's a reasonably objective analysis to say it's utterly failed. That's the first thing to say. I mean, you need to look at the top line stat, right? Mm. (laughs) If you're going to do accurate analysis, you don't want to be saying, well, you know, this country did a little thing in 2010 or whatever. So 
we need to be clear about how we analyse failure in a relatively objective way. And in terms of the analysis why that has failed, it's because the, the, the well, there's lots of things you can say, but the main story as I see it is that the corporate elite managed to meta-frame the debate in 1992 as a technocratic problem rather than as a, a problem of, of genocidal intent by the global elites. Do you and think, it, it, is it just a sort of a supremely unfortunate historical fact that we see the death and decline of sort of organised labour, the idea of socialism or the idea of a different kind of political configuration to capitalism uh, in the 1980s and then the 1990s climate change comes along? It seems a rather, it seems like bad luck, right? And we, we lack the sort of theoretical and political tools to actually understand the issues you're talking about. Well, was that by, I, I, well, was that by I, I design think, as well? I think, I think the liberal, I think the liberal class in 1990 allowed itself to be duped by the corporate class into using the frame of the corporate class. That's the first thing to say. And I think the left space um, also allowed itself to be duped to think that the climate was something separate, the environment was something separate than the social confrontation of the last 200 years. It's not another chapter in that confrontation. And it's the last chapter in that confrontation. Why is it the last chapter in our confrontation? Because... We've been around, what, two, two 300,000 years? As a species, that's I That's mean. a rhetorical question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, do you, so you... No, but look, th there, there is a world, and I, I, I can totally foresee it. We can talk about a world of three, four, five degrees warmer than today. Most people are going to die. Of course they are. But you, I want to know why you think it's existential for humanity, why it would wipe well, out Well, you just humanity. said why it's existential. Have I? Go on. Yeah, because billions of people are going to die if we get to three, four, five degrees. But that's not the final, that's not the final, look, this is a s silly pedantic point, but it's not, that wouldn't be the final chapter, would it? Because humanity would still survive. We still, you know, we, we've had bottlenecks in our population up and down through history and we've survived as a species. You, you might be able to say, well, that is just one more, one of those bottlenecks, right? We've had extinction level events quote unquote which we've survived well i i could give you loads of data to show it's more or less certain that we're going to go absolutely extinct instead of effectively extinct but i'm not going to far away no i'm not going to answer these but questions well, that's a good question but i don't know i don't know that data so i'd love to hear about it yeah well the point is you know we've only got an hour right and we okay so point point towards why that's a, a useful thing to say then you're saying it's not useful to talk about facts at this point in time like most people listening to this have been hearing the facts for the last 30 years what we need to talk about is an accurate analysis of what's going on and what our political and moral responsibilities are at this time. But we're going to do that. But no, no, this is really important, Roger, because you're saying that we could go extinct. And I think one of the problems for the Green Movement, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, actually, whether it's liberal, radical, is that people make statements which actually they then don't subsequently back up. And then that means that people like Nigel Farage can say, well, you say these things, you don't really mean it. No, I totally disagree with you. God, was <laughs> So, so, you, so you don't think you need to back up things that you say about uh, us being obliterated as a species? No, in the same way as you can say, you know, six million Jews died in World War II or murdered in World War II. You don't have to give like a, a 15 minute explanation of how many died in what, what concentration camp. If someone asked you to verify that, then that'd be a fraud or obscene activity. Because all you need to know is well, it is that it happened. It's already happened, but this is speculatively in the future. Yes, what, what, I'm, what, I'm trying, what I'm trying to say, like, I was on... Um, okay, let me, let me give you a little example. Just Good. like a tangential thing, yeah. right? Yeah, so, we love tangents. Um, you know Lady Mitford? She was, in, she was married to the... Um, was the guy who was head of the fascists in the 1930s. Mosley. Yeah. So Lady Mitford, you know, she was a Hitler fan, blah, blah, blah. After World War II, she was interviewed by B B the BBC. And it was a little bit like an interview like it, like this. And the the interviewer said, um, six million Jews died in World War II. Uh, what, what do you make of that? And she said, um, I don't think it was that many. So... Analyse that. What, why is she saying that? She's saying that so that the rest of the interview can have some slightly obscene discussion about whether it was 5.8 or 6.2, by which time the interview is over. Right? So 
I mean, I've been, I've, I've, I've been in like dozens, maybe a hundred interviews. No, hold on, with Roger. Let, no, let me just let me just finish. No, this, this is important. This is an important point, then. right? Yeah, please, please. The, the important point is 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 the left is in a paradigm, right, of fetishization of information. Information is not that important. I'm, I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You need to know that two degrees, thousand million people are going to be refugees. That's all you need to know. When I, I've done over a hundred public talks. I don't need to talk about the climate that much. What I want, need to talk about is the notion of the violation of fundamental values. If I talk to the liberal elites or I've talked to the left elite, you know, like you sort of thing, no Good. disrespect. Please. Then there's oh, an, there's, true. Th this is, this is a, 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 this is part of society which has what I would call an enlightenment fetish, right? You know, in 1750, various like, white blokes of a certain age in Western society decided information was very important rather than belief and religion. And there's a lot going for it, particularly when you're dealing with natural science. When you're dealing with human affairs, it's relatively unimportant. What's important is the creation of moral systems and meaning systems. So when I, when I talk to people like you or people in the liberal class, they're obsessed. They want to know the details of why we're going to go extinct. You know, what happens at 60 degrees? Well, no, I want to know, well, I want yeah. to know your arguments. Of course it's I It's not an argument. It's information, right? Yeah, but you've, you've made a point, and I'm saying, well, how do you get that? I mean, that's a perfectly normal thing to do. Yeah, but if I go to Sunderland and I talk to a working class grandmother, right, after 15 minutes, she's in tears. Because all she needs to know we'll is, to is, am I credible? Well, I'm reasonably credible. Well, I'm a farmer and why should I be bullshitting her, right? Yeah. Right. And number two, shit's going to happen. What she wants to spend the rest of the meeting talking Hold about on. is what yep. she's going to do about it. Hold on. So here's the thing, Roger. Here's the thing. And this, is, this gets the very root of a lot of the political action around inaction, rather, about the climate crisis. Everybody, nearly everybody, know that knows there's a huge problem. What are we debating? The intensity and the timeline. No, that, no, no, no. Let's hold start, on. Let's let, me, start no, again. let me let me finish. Let me finish. Yeah, okay. And that's why. No, that's why. Actually, the credible predictions thing it does sort of matter because look, we can see two degrees warming in the next several decades, and it's important to say to our audience, very, very plausible. Or it might take the next several hundred years. Ultimately, our planet's five billion years old. We're talking about here a very small rounding error. Either of those situations are very bad for our species. The point is, we'll be around for the first one. Our grandchildren won't be around for the second one. So when you're talking about this within a political context, that difference matters, Roger, no, doesn't it? No. No? No. Why? With all due respect. Go on. And dare I say, I've got quite a lot of empirical support. Seeing you do? No, I've no. helped set up, you know, some major mobilisations. Yeah. Okay, th this is the process of mobilising people, in my semi-expert opinion, right? It's 5% information. It's 50% the confrontation with their values. The sen their sense of violation, and it's 45% pathways to action. Information about what to do next week, you know, where you're going to go on this demonstration, where you, when you're going to be trained, right? Now, if you talk to an advertising person, they'd, they'd immediately organize, recognize that. The, re the reason the left is so, you know, with no due respect, like massively unsuccessful is because it doesn't understand the fundamentals of modern psychological research. Right, people are not interested oh, I agree with you. in information. Oh, I agree with you. Roger, I don't disagree. You know, you've got people like Max Weber at the start of the 20th century. He's talking about socialist, socialist politics, the, the rise of the labor movement. And he's saying a great deal of this is highly irrational. When they go on their demonstrations and their marches with their red flags, it reminds them of a religious procession. So, you know, it's not it's nothing new. And I agree with you, the left's forgotten much of it. And we had Mehdi Hassan here last week. He made the exact same point. You know, you need to be persuasive, not just through facts, but also through passion, through often humor. So it's often highly, quote unquote, non-rational things which matter in persuasion. I agree with all of that, but you surely must see it. it's a bit of an Achilles heel if people make predictions and then they go wrong. It's like being a millenarian, and that's a word we'll definitely return to, and you're saying the world will end on this day, and I know you're not saying that. The world will end on this day, and then it doesn't end, and then you've got no credibility. So let's say in 20, 30 years' time, actually, some of the things we're not expecting haven't quite panned out the way they have, right? Like we see, for instance, with some of the publications, um, you know, the, the Group of Rome, for instance, in the 1970s, making predictions around the world today, which were very wrong. Do you not then think you lose credibility as a movement? Well, you lose credibility with the liberal elite, yeah, because the liberal elite are an enlightenment cult, right? But like ordinary people aren't that bothered, for better or worse. 
what ordinary people what ordinary people are more bothered about is whether something looks cool, whether it looks authentic, whether it gives them like a pathway to some sort of meaning. That's what most people most of the time. But are wasn't this the problem for the left in the twentieth century? Marx predicts, you know, the downfall of capitalism, and it it doesn't happen, and that's why people, billions of people have a certain view of the world at the start and the middle midpoint of the 20th century, towards the end they don't. Because actually it turns out that the decline, the downfall of capitalism doesn't play out like he predicted. So it does matter. And by the way, in the long run, I think he's right. But mm. that, that's why the timing of these predictions matters, doesn't it? But it's, a, but it's a red herring, isn't it, at this stage? It's not like I'm running around like making exact predictions. I mean, obviously people will misrepresent what I say to make it sound like I'm saying it's the end of the world. I'm not saying it's the end of the world. I'm saying we're looking at Effective extinction. When? I'm not going to answer the question because you're taking me down that road. No, but next hundred years. I mean, no. that's a, that's a big. No, no, no. What we effective see, extinction. We're not talking yeah, about extinction. Anymore. Yeah, so we're saying yeah, lots of people yes. are dying. How quick? No, because what I'm trying to do, Aaron, is challenge you about where this interview goes. I've done hundreds of interviews, so like I just get bored of them. Right? I'm not interested in going to an interview to try and have an intellectual discussion. But our audience is interested, Roger. They want to know no, when hundreds of millions of people I, I, are going to start dying. They can go and look it up. You know, just go on the internet. You're You'll the find out. You're the no, authority. No, no, no. I'm the authority. I'm the authority in how to mobilise people effectively. That's a different. That's a different skill set. If you want to go and find out, you know, when we're hitting, I've, I've told you a fact, right? You did about the refugees. So that's yeah. enough, right? What more do you need to know? And, and when right, is that? the late 2030s, there'll be 1,000 million refugees. Let's let's look at that in more detail. So, at what point? I was going to ask you this, Aaron, because you're probably more intelligent than me on this. At what point Excellent. does the at what point does the global economy collapse? How many how many million refugees has there to be in the world? in order for the global economy to collapse? That's know. a good question. I'm and putting, also... I'm putting a gun to your head. No, I would say I would say the thing that collapses first is actually various political systems. Yes, but how many refugees are going to undermine undermine the global oh, complexity? In terms of, I think that would easily do it, wouldn't it? Of course it would. Well, give me a number. Well, I think a couple Off of... Off the top of your head. I think a couple of hundred million yes, would do it, correct. frankly. Or at least that's what I think too. Yeah. Between 200 million refugees and 400 million refugees... I mean, there's 8, million, 8 billion people in the world, let's yeah. say, for sake of argument. So we're looking at that around 2030, 2035. So Suella Brevman's right. When she says that hundreds of millions of people want, will want to come to Europe, want to come to Britain, she's, I mean, she's right. Oh, yes. Yeah, this is something that the left has got its head buried in the sand about. But, of course, their solution is to move towards a fascistic scenario, right? The reason the left is going to fail is because it hasn't got a plan. <laughs> because it's not actually talking about it. And if it talks about it, people get cancelled. People get cancelled for talking about yes, because, hundreds of millions because, of refugees. Because it's what, you know, particularly the postmodernist urban Western left doesn't want to, isn't interested in reality. It's not interested in the notion that everything's going to go. Like, that's just an opinion. And this is why that whole move has been so disastrous. And that's why I get cancelled, right? Well, hold on. I'm, I'm very interested in this because I agree with you. And I, when I saw, I mean, Suella Bremen, she, she said lots of stupid things. Yeah, well, let's not focus on no, the... No, no, hold on. Let's just, not focus on the... Right, right. Let's, hold on. Let me, Roger, let me finish. The, she said lots of strange things, but she said something which was, you know, 100 million people will, will be moving towards Europe. And I, that's broadly correct. Look, we're already struggling with 50,000, 60,000 undocumented migrants coming over the English Channel every year, as it is. And I think you're right. The, the left is like, don't let them all in. No, 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 that's hold, not the issue. Let me finish, that's, Roger. Let okay. me finish, please. Because it's for our audience as well, not just yeah. between me and you. The left will say, let them all in. And of course we can. But the point is, as you've said, as it gets worse, 50, 60 is going to become hundreds of thousands of climate refugees. It's going to happen. And like you say, right now, the left doesn't have an answer for it. So what is the answer? Civil resistance, obviously. It's a no-brainer. It's a genocide project, right? And it's locked in. Two facts. It's a genocide project and it's locked in. So it's like, it's an act of war. But hold on, you're, not, you're the non-violence guy. Yeah, that doesn't mean... So you're mean, saying it's an act of war, but it's we an act just, of war by the, the It's an act of war by the elites, right? Against the poorest people in the world. Yeah. Right? And we can split hairs about intentionality. That's not really the issue, no, right? I agree with that. The issue is, is that's a violation of all human values and it's a violation on steroids of socialist values right 
So my challenge to the socialist space is, where's your solidarity? Why aren't you in prison, Aaron? I, well, they, you know, I tried my best, but they only gave me, they gave me a probation order. <laughs> this is years ago, though, I should say. It yes. was in the 2011 student protest. But it's not a frivolous question, right? I don't care whether you go to prison or not. What I'm trying to say is that the left have to, has to organise, otherwise it's going to get crushed. Hold on. So... Because you've got 10 years in order to create a social movement and a social front, like the Popular Front in 1936, right? Similar thing, which is actually serious about communicating to the public exactly what's going to happen. I agree with much of that, but I just want to get to the heart of this. You said it's a war against the poorest people in the world, and I, I agree with that entirely. And that's not just purely metaphorical, by the way. There, there are literal wars fought against the poorest people in the world. If you look at, for instance, you know... I'm not being in the slightest no, sense but, metaphorical. Yeah, no, but for, Civil War in Democratic Republic of Congo is about getting precious minerals and ores out of that country. Millions of people yeah. died. So... I agree with all of that. So, but then why nonviolence? Surely this is an argument. Andreas Mann would come along and say, well, this is the reason why we need to have, you know, not violent revolution necessarily, but you need to have political, the conversation around political violence needs to be more intelligent. No, no, we're not talking about a debate and we're not talking about violence. That's like an irrelevancy. Well, no, it's not because you just said that they, they declared war on the poorest people in the yeah, world. So yeah, we, are, yes. we are talking about violence. Yeah, no, You're no, just what, saying it can only go what, one way. No, what I, you're trying to get me down intellectual rabbit holes. Right? Not, not at all. <laughs> no, no. What, you made a big point, which I agree with, and I yeah. wonder why nonviolence is the response. You're the nonviolence guy. That's why I'm asking. Normally people say, you're violent. I'm not saying you're violent. I'm okay. saying, should well, you be violent? This, this, is, this is what I'm suggesting, right? Which is, I've just said to you, that there's a meeting of the of people who watch this, right? And you and me to talk about what people on the left are going to do in order to engage in civil resistance over the next few months. That's what I want to talk about. I don't need to talk about some arcane discussions about violence and nonviolence, right? I don't need to It's hugely to talk important about... to your strategy, isn't it? No. It's no. Roger, of course it is. Because no. you're living... You're li your whole you, strategy is about you, nonviolence. No. And I want you to say, well, no. look, if, if it's war on one side, nonviolence on the other side, that's going to fail, this is isn't my it? strategy, is to go into the interview, right, and ground the interview <clears throat> in the immediacy of social struggle, which is what all social change agents have done for the last 250 years, Right? Right? that the intelligentsia is the problem, right? Roger, I agree with all of this, but I'm then wondering, the mechanism that you then refer to, which is the non-violent protest, that seems well, I, I, very... I, I, I've, I've been mobilising people... Very weak compared to... I've been mobilising people, you know, 60 hours a week for the last three years, right? The, the issue with violence is an irrelevance. You don't get people coming to meetings going, well, you know, I've read a book that says violence is a good idea. Because the people who come to meetings don't give a shit about that sort of thing, right? No, no, but you're the one that's saying that. Nobody's saying violence is a good idea. You're the, one that's saying, saying is, no, you're the one saying, no, it's a bad idea. It can never happen. Nobody's saying it's a good idea. You're the one that's... It's not an issue. You're the one that's it's circumscribing not certain... It's not an issue. Well, so for instance, have you read uh, Ministry of the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson? About, you know, it's a really important book. You read no. this? So it's about how basically we address climate change. And it's a really, it's a work of fiction. And a part of the book is a UN general secretary basically commissions a black ops wing to take on the global 1%. And they start blowing up private jets. And I, I can say all of this on the virus. It's in a book recommended funnily, by Barack Obama, which I found quite, you know, quite funny. But there you are. And that is obviously, and okay, speculatively, you say, okay, I can see how that would work. People stop taking chartered jets, private jets, because this black ops wing, which is actually involved with the UN is, is blowing them up. I don't think that's right, but that's just this work of fiction. That to me is like a, these people have all the power, they have all the political power, they're waging war against people. This is then the analogous response. But, but sitting in rows and saying kumbaya, that doesn't seem as serious to me. Who's sitting in rows? Well, that would, be, that would be how, say, Piers Morgan would, would characterise just a poil. That's how he would. Yeah, well, well, I think we're amazing, we, by the way. We I'm, don't, we don't, we don't need to engage with that, do we? <laughs> what I'm, what I'm concrete, what I'm trying to do is, is reintroduce a notion of praxis to the British left, right? And the British left has retreated into theory, 
and into miserable defeatism over the last 30 years. And I'm 56, so I've seen it first. Oh, yeah, no, right? no, no disputing that. So well, what we need to talk about... Well, the RMT what, and that aren't, yeah. aren't defeaters, but generally, yes. No, as a, as a structural phenomenon. Yeah, yeah right? the Labour movement's on the rise, and, I agree. And when part, a central part of that is the conversation that you want to have with me now. So you, what you want to do is, is, is talk about something that's of great intellectual interest. You know, I can talk to you about violence and non-violence until a cow's comes home. It's not relevant in a one-hour interview when billions of people are it's going to die. It's hugely relevant. It's hugely relevant. Because every single interview you have, 90% of the interviews you have, they'll be like, do you condemn this? I'm not saying that. Mm. I'm saying, wow, given the scale of the challenges, given how horrific the other side are, actually maybe you're not being violent enough. Yeah. That's, that's what I would say. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not calling for violence. I'm not inciting anything. Yeah. I'm not participating. I'm just saying, if you're saying the challenge is this awful, and we're looking at billions of people dying, the response doesn't seem appropriate. Yeah, and I'm saying that's not praxis, right? What praxis says is looking at what's going to happen next Wednesday, and then you go and do something next Wednesday, and then you theorise on what happens next Wednesday. Right? It's the interaction between practice and theory. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what I'm saying is, is, is the movement, the left in general, is split between people who do practice and people who do theory, right? So what, what you want me to engage in... I don't think that's accurate, by the way. What? I think everybody at Navarra Media has been involved in political activism and they've been arrested or faced arrest. I don't think that's accurate, but... Right, but we haven't got a critical mass. We haven't got a critical mass of people engaged in civil resistance. And one of the main reasons we haven't got a critical mass is because the intellectual left, right, creates a distraction. It's creating a distraction for what the real task is. Do you is. think that is the yes. reason why? Do you not know yeah. just think it's because right now we're at the pinnacle of a certain kind of civilization powered by fossil fuels, which we both agree isn't going to last very long, at least all forever, and that right now life is good enough for a certain number of people? And, that, well, uh, I, I, and then once I, I, we go I, I, past a certain point, then I think people will be more pr provoked to action, won't they? Yes. Well, I'm not. I'm not talking about it's that not the, level. It's not the, I'm not. It's I'm not, not, I'm, not talking, I'm not talking about that level of analysis, right? Impasse. I'm talking about. Let's take London. You know, March 2023. That's praxis. You start with the time and place you're in. Okay. What what I what I'm suggesting is that what Navarin needs to do is integrate itself with the frontline struggle. Right, so what we want you we to do... We are doing that. Yeah. We're, we, we're having a conversation so here's with you, my, Here's my challenge to you, Aaron, right? You're a very intelligent and clever chap, and I like you a lot, and a lot of people like you a lot. You have lots of people who respect you, and I'm not massaging your ego by saying that, just being observational. A lot of people like me, a lot of people don't like me, blah, blah, blah. Just what I'm, trying, what I'm saying is, is what the challenge for you is, is to go and do what Gary Lineker did, right? So Gary Lineker is a classic example of praxis in action, right? He has a theory, which is bad to treat people like shit. He goes out and challenges the powers that be, and he wins, right? Well, what Gary Lineker did wasn't particularly radical. It's just the fact that he has the position of power and he said what he said. Exactly. So you've got a position of power. I say that all the time. I you've got that. a position of power. You're not as powerful as him, right? But you've got a position of power. So in classical civil resistance, needs leadership from the intellectual leaders, right? This is the Gramsci idea, isn't it? Organic intellectuals and all that sort of stuff. What you need to do, because it's an emergency and millions of people are going to die and all the rest of it, so it's a big deal, right, is to say, right, I'm going to lead a march, you know, after the big one, the XR march. I'm going to take a day off work. I'm going to bring all my staff and we're going to walk along Holborn, right? And when the police say, if you carry on walking along that road, you're going to get arrested. You're going to say, you know, do your worst. And then you'll be in prison and blah, blah, blah. And then you'll come out and you'll have half a million people watching you. Okay. So I, I agree with much of that. I think Navarro should, I think we all go on protest. I, I don't disagree with any of We're that. We're not talking about protest here, I, I, right? I, I, just, 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 yeah, let no, me no. challenge you. Yeah, no, uh, let me challenge you. We're not talking about protest Potential here. criminal activity. What we, no, no, no. Or whatever We're you talking arrest. about a strategy, a yeah. confrontation with the British regime. That's not protest. You understand what no, I'm no, trying no, to you're say? You're right, you're right. There's a semantic like, pro mistake protest, on my part, yeah. You know, as if you're familiar with, you know, 19th century leftists, they were very clear about this, right? Protest is saying, I don't like what the government's doing, so I'm going to express that I don't like it, right? What we've been saying to the British public space for three years since we started Extinction Rebellion is we're not doing protest. 
what we're doing is civil res- what civil resistance is it means we will engage in whatever nonviolent activity is necessary to materially challenge your power that's a different strategy right and that's different obviously from terrorism and civil war which is nobody said, no, I'm not I'm not, suge- I'm not suggesting that there's a debate obviously People like Andreas Mam, he wrote a book, very provocative title, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. That's obviously a very different strategy to just being arrested. Yes, I don't want to talk about that because we've only got an hour. What yeah. I want to talk about is how do how do we do mid-level design in Britain at this moment in time? And this is what I want you to come to a Zoom call for, right, next week. And I want you to put it on your, you know, on your video with the Zoom link, please. You well, they, that, they know. They, well, they know it's. A, hold on. So let, let's go to this thing about arrest. So this is something you've always said about your theory of change: is that you need a certain percentage of the population to be arrested, basically, to create a tipping point socially. Yes. Well, I've been so, misrepresented, as you so probably know. Right. Yeah. I, I'm not saying people need to get arrested. I'm saying people engage in civil resistance, and as a byproduct of that, people will be arrested, and as a byproduct of that, people will go to prison. For instance, like four months ago, I did a speech, right? And I got put in prison for four months. Here's my sweatshirt just to prove it. 105 days, right? 105 days, right? No trial, you know, a charge of conspiracy to cause public nuisance for giving a speech. That's that's where we're at at this point with the British state. And you were never charged? I've been charged, but I'm trying to get it this. But it's a it's a conspiracy to cause public nuisance. Giving a speech is not a conspiracy to cause public nuisance. Uh, understand well, the difference? So what, why were you in prison for 105 days? On remand, because what they do is they put people in prison to get them out of the way. Right. The 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 trial is not. I've got a I've got a a tag on. Right. I I need to be in my house at 10 o'clock tonight, and I'm allowed. To, I'm not allowed to travel anywhere around the UK. Potentially, that's going to go on for the next year. This is, you know, mid-level state repression, classically speaking. Is it mid-level? I mean, it's quite high-level, personally. Well, from a global perspective, yeah, right? Let's quite, keep, keep But I think most people in the UK a, wouldn't, a, be, what, wouldn't believe this is possible, what's happened to you personally. No, no. And this is the process through which the thought leaders and the intellectual leaders of the left have to actually lead the movement, right? Because you amplify it. If you've got a tag on and if you've been in prison for 105 days, then you'll get like 2 million views, right? Because people that, this is the process of political change, is is the leaders of movements front those movements, right? And they amplify the injustice that, you know, some ordinary guy is never going to do. So you've got a massive responsibility, Aaron, to actually engage, engage in civil resistance. I'm not saying give up your job, right? You're a good interviewer and all the rest of it with Navarra. What I'm I'm not I'm not against intellectual like labor. No, Far I don't, from I don't, it, that right? Doesn't, that doesn't what I'm, what, 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 what I'm inviting you to do and Navarra to do, and that's why I've come here today. I don't want to talk about bloody violence for God's sake. What I'm coming to talk to you today is is, is about something which is at the heart of praxis, right? Which well, is on, you said you don't which want... is to combine which is to combine like intellectual activity and podcasts and all this sort of stuff with civil resistance. You said you don't want to talk about violence. A great deal of violence has been inflicted on you. A great deal of violence. This isn't what's happening to you. It's not non-violent. It is very violent. It's just you're taking all the violence. 105 days in prison, you've got a tag. They're traumatising you. Isn't that violent? Well, it may be or it may not be, but that's not what I'm interested in talking about with you. No, but it's hugely important. You're saying non No, it's not particularly I important. Know, it's not particularly important. It's hugely important. And it's even important for what you're saying because you're saying you get moral authority and credibility precisely because you're the, the victim of violence. Yes, yeah. I mean, I'm good so case it's hugely study. important. Yes, yes. Like lots more people will know about me because I've been bunged in prison for, for four months. But it's not, it's, what's happened to me as an individual is not important. What's What's I'm not saying it's important or unimportant. I'm saying it's violent. It's violent. There's definitely violence <laughs> yeah, well, going on. Well, if you want to call it violence, it's violence. That's not what interests me and that's not what I want to talk to you about. What I want to talk to you about and, and your listeners is what do we do now, right? Where are we at in terms of the British state in 2023? Well, hold on. We have been talking about that and you've been saying me and the people watching this should also go to prison for four months. No, 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 no. Let's get the phraseology right. No one particularly wants to go to prison, Right. You know, leaving that issue aside. Yep, park it. Let's 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 focus on what the theory of change here is. 
is that people with a following, a public, a public following, whether it's Gary Lineker or you know Brian Eno or you or whoever, right? All these these public cultural figures need to engage in civil resistance. If they do, then we'll win. That's my proposition to you. In the same in the same sense, Gary Lineker has won on something that's fairly minor. And what this the this is this is the empirical information I'll share with you, in so much as you want the information, right? Which is the biggest climate inverted commas campaigns of the last twelve months have all been organised by about five hundred people around the Western world. So we've got what one billion people in the Western world. Five hundred people have created like massive campaigns. Like I think the figures last year for these campaigns were four and a half million hits in on the media. Right, almost as big as XR. It was ever thus. It was ever thus. Yes. Karl now, Marx was involved in the International Working Men's Association. That's it's, ever, it's always been yes. like that. Yes. So it's a relatively small number of people, uh, but they need to be amplified to ten thousand people. And I'm not giving you. I'm, I'm not just giving you a hard time for the sake oh, of give it. Give me right? a hard time. You can. <laughs> I'm that's, saying that's there's the a massive a at this moment. There's a massive opportunity for public figures on the left to amplify that to the tipping point. And we're almost at tipping points defined as forcing Western governments to change legislation. Now, I'm not pretending for a moment that's the end of the story, right? And I'll come on to that in a minute. But the fact of the matter is in France, like the civil resistance movements that I help facilitate are going to be speaking to Macron in Germany with the blocking of the motorways. There's regional governments that have agreed with the demands of last generation. Right? And they've got millions and millions of hits and they've raised like a million dollars and all the rest of it. Right? That's all being created through this methodology of sustained civil resistance. Right? And what I'm saying is, is to get that past, get that point where you're going to force a state, like what's just happened with the BBC, to retreat, which is entirely possible, of course. We need public figures on the left to, to, to take a lead. And there's no... There's, there's no time to lose, is there? So some, some quick points, I suppose. Is this whole discourse around civil society generating change in the West, is it kind of missing the big point here, which is actually the, 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 the real people that matter in terms of whether or not we, be, I know you don't want to talk about carbon, but begin to transition our economies away from fossil fuels. The real actors that matter actually are people like the Chinese Communist Party. And it's nice for Europeans and Westerners to think that we're driving history, but actually it's the 20th conference of the Chinese Communist Party and they're saying we're going to build all these nuclear stations and hydropower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But look, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, because our audience might not know this. <laughs> In three years, China is using more concrete than the United States did for the whole, more cement rather, than the United States did for the whole of the 20th century. So actually... It's very comforting to think that we're changing history here in the West, but realistically, right now, the biggest variable is what happens in Asia. It's not us. Okay, so there's a little analogy, right? You're in 1943, and a resistance fighter knocks at your door and it says, I've got a family of Jews down the road who need to be put up by you. And what you say is, look, like where the Holocaust is happening is in Eastern Europe. There's no point in me taking those Jews in. Is it like that? Yeah. Basically what, you're well, no, saying, we're not talking, that's, basically what you're saying is is you're abdicating moral responsibility. I'm not at all. I think I think I think it's nice for you, Europeans, less so the US, because the US is still a growing economy, expanding population, but Europe has stagnating living standards, we're, 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 stagnating we're, we're, CO2 emissions, and, and politically, economically, technologically, it just doesn't matter anymore. It just doesn't matter anymore. You're not, China, you're not, the US, and you're not, India you're not, matter. You're not taking in the Jews in 1943, right? Because you're trying to make things matter or not matter. You're taking the Jews in in 1943 because that's the, that's the human thing to do, right? It's not about making a calculation. There's been research on people that took Jews in, in in the Second World War. And if you're not familiar with it, like there's no sociological determinism in, his, in it, right? It's not like people were rich or poor or Catholic or atheist, right? There's no rhyme or reason. Why is that? It's because a certain minority of people find it intolerable to stand by when gross injustice is happening. Roger, I just think there's lots of... look. We that's can that's the main point. We can talk about 1.5 or 2 or 2.5. And, and I, I understand why you say, I don't want to talk about facts. But the point is, how quickly are we going towards something which is really awful? That, and that's the difference between 1.5 and 2 and 2.5 and 3. And actually, 
the policies of the Chinese Communist Party matter a hell of a lot more than what we're doing. And I know that's not to say, what, what we shouldn't care then, we should do, we like, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that there's a comforting myth here that actually white Europeans determine the course of human history because that's what's happened for the last 200 years. My point is, it's no longer the case. And actually, we're sort of peddling something which makes us feel important. Maybe we're just not that important anymore. And the fate of this primarily is about how Asia develops over the 21st century and then later on Africa. Africa's population is what, going to double between now and 2050? How it develops and its relationship to capitalism, its relationship to fossil fuels, is far more important than what you or I do. Far more important. Well, that's why I call intellectual masturbation. It's not, it's, it's true. I know it's true. What it doesn't do you, mean you should, it, shouldn't block roads. I'm not suggesting that. Go block roads. Of course it matters. Of course, and it's morally important. But it, it's less important than the stuff I just said. It has nothing to do with praxis. Oh, of course it does. Because there's no practical of implication. There is. There's no practical implication. Of course there what, is. What do you, you can't go to China to influence it. Of course what, you can. The essence of praxis. Of course you can. The, the, pra the essence of praxis. It's about where power is. Look, look, the essence of praxis, as you, I'm sure you know, because you're just winding me up, right? Is, is. <laughs> Well, you're just asking a Murdoch question. You're all it's wasting time. It's not a Murdoch time. question. It is a, it's a Murdoch question because it doesn't, no one gives a fuck about China, right? No, this is hugely, I'm sorry, Roger, I really disagree. Like a third, how, how do you know? A third to a quarter of humanity, about a third of humanity. Like, like, start that, please, no, please, please, I've, got the, then, I've got the empirics, right? Then you right? can respond to this. No, but then you no, can no, 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 no. A third no, of humanity look, look. at the start of the 20th century was what European. Okay. Very soon, it's going to be one eighth of humanity. So this idea, when I say white European, I'm including people in the United States of white heritage. So when we talk about these people, that is not what humanity looks like anymore. They don't sound or look like us. And so this idea that we're the ones def defining human like fate and whether or not we get off fossil fuels and whether or not we address, I don't agree with you. The biggest challenge in the history of our species, there are other people involved in this story too. So the idea that it's Western activists, I, I, it's, they're not the main players. I know, it's like, it's intellectual masturbation, <laughs> right? The reason it's intellectual <laughs> masturbation is it has fuck all to do with actually making a difference. But you can right? make a difference. Let me give you a little... If Chinese uh, activists uh, are watching Roger Hallam and going, this guy, Chinese, wow, he's Chinese, brilliant. Chinese activists are not going to be watching me, and even Why if they're dead... I'm sure they've read your book. I'm sure they have. No, I'm sure they, of course they have. I'm yeah, sure they have. I don't even have. want to go with that. It's just a ridiculous like, question. Right? <laughs> the, the, key, the, key, the key issue... Right. The key issue here is what is the moral responsibility and the political responsibility of people in this time and place, which is in the UK in 2023. Right. That's the central socialist orientation, I, I would suggest. Right. In terms of the 250 year tradition of saying we are going to create change. Right. The purpose is to create change, as Karl Marx said. What did he say? Philosophers interpreted the world. Yeah, forward, back You're forward. interpreting the world, yeah. right? No one gives a fuck I'm about not China. No, 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 no. You've, I, no, no. Right. What? No. no let, just let if me finish. We, let no, me finish. We could do this let interview, me... and we could we could subtitle it in Chinese precisely because we no, want no, to no, make, no, no. Just, it's just a rabbit hole. It's, it's like not violence. a rabbit it's hole. Like, well, no. Well, it's about building partnership with the people who actually do have real, as well as the stuff you're saying. I'm not suggesting don't do I, it. I've I've been but, on, I've been on a whole number of calls, just for the record, mm. right, with people in the Far East. And the notion of creating partnerships with people in China is like practically like ridiculous what? for various reasons I'm not going to go into because right? it's not relevant. The, I was the, invited there to talk about my book. <laughs> I was invited to yeah. Shan what, for what COVID. We, what we need to focus on, what your responsibility is in this interview is to focus on what we are going to do, right? Partially because you're supposed to be a socialist and partially because you're a human being, Right. Your, your responsibility is not to hypothesize about things that are practically irrelevant at this moment because we're in an emergency. Hold on. <clears throat> this is like saying, <clears throat> we, we, we talked about Karl Marx, socialist movement. Karl Marx, born in Trier, born in Germany. That's like saying, well, Karl Marx cares about the status and the plight of the working class who needs to stay in Germany. Well, no, he went to where he thought production was most highly developed, which at the time was, was the United Kingdom, was London. He also went to, to the United States. Because that's where power <clears throat> and agency and the future resided. So, but you're saying that's wrong. You're saying that Karl Marx should have stayed in Trier and agitated amongst workers there. And what he did was intellectual masturbation. Maybe it's you do just think that. It's really complicated. It's it? not at all. No, no, it's not at all, actually. It's not at all. I'm saying that power resides in a bunch of places. It still resides, of course, in the global north amongst white European countries. It's in a bunch of places. Right. Let's, let's say this. If your book let's was say, translated say... into Chinese, I said, this is a really big deal. 
You're but, saying it's nothing. It doesn't, doesn't matter. All right. Well, we're going to carry on talking about two different things because I'm not going to engage with that, right? So I'm going to I'll continue stop. talking about what I want to talk about. There's 5,000 people, let's say, watching this conversation. Maybe there's a few more, right? You know, maybe something dramatic happens and there's 50,000. Who, You know, there's a, there's a situation. This this is this is the sort of the sort of approach that has made the projects that I've involved in like massively successful. And I'm not claiming like I'm, I'm step you know I'm they standing on the shoulders yeah. of a long tradition of praxis, right? Going back to the French Revolution. So there's nothing I'm going to tell you that's that hasn't been said a hundred times before in the socialist tradition. Is it's totally useless at best and utterly distracting at worst to entertain intellectual questions which have no relevance to the time and place you're in. Right? I just don't think that's true. I'm not, first of all, they are relevant. And you're saying, but hold on, you're saying theory and practice. And then when I raise the theory, but you say, don't talk about the theory. This is the theory. The, fear, the theory is, is, is that you come on the march in, in April, mm -hmm. right? You risk being arrested. You talk about it on, on your show. You get 10 times the number of people doing it. Three or four percent of those people decide to take your lead, your lead right? Then those people go to the street and you get to the tipping point where the government is forced to engage with stopping various, you know, uh, particular policy questions, right? That's, that's, a, that's a theory, yeah. right? It's a theoretical construction and it's based upon the engagement in practice. That's what, I, that's what I'm interested in talking to you yeah, about. Yeah, I'll ask a question about that, about, about that then. Are you optimistic about that? Because obviously you, you're right to say you've been involved. It's very unusual, right, for social movements to be successful. You've been involved in very successful social movements. So you're talking about the theory. You're, you know, obviously, the political context and so on for the next couple of years. Are you optimistic? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let me just say optimism and pessimism is not what gets me up in the morning. Sure. What gets me up in the morning, uh, like with any rebels, is the fundamental obscenity of what's going, hap going to happen. So I don't want to say, oh, we're optimistic, therefore you should act. But in terms of like an intellectual prediction of what's going to happen in Western societies, I'm enormously optimistic, yes, because we're going to be heading into a time of enormous social stress and that creates enormous social fluidity, as I'm sure you know, and that creates the potentiality to create a new society. So that's, that's something, you know, for another conversation, right? But... What I think the people who have created the civil resistance projects are moving towards is, is to move into the social sphere in the next two years because the left isn't doing its job, to be blunt, and, and to create a social confrontation using social language with a social demand. And I think the... The reason the social sphere hasn't activated is because it hasn't been provided with pathways towards resistance by the present leadership of the left. And if the left isn't going to do it, then other people are going well, to do on, you've it. But you've been, you've been very effectively providing leadership for several years. Very, just a yes, but as you, as, These, are, these as, are household names, <coughs> Extinction Rebellion, yes, just a But there's, why aren't the nurses sitting down in, in Whitehall? for instance, right? You know, as, as a professional ah. practitioner, as yeah. you might say, of effective campaigns, I would say with a little bit of organisation, the nurses could get their pay increase if 500 of them sat down four or five times in Westminster. Why isn't that happening? The reason it's not happening... So you're talking about the pay dispute rather than... Yes, the pay dispute. It for, okay, it's yeah. just an example, as right? A, yeah, and I'm a, not saying a it's a done deal. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. what I'm saying is, is as, as someone knows about these things... That campaign could be won for civil resistance in in a matter of 10, 14 days. Right? I think that's a respectable prediction because there's enormous support for the nurses and there'll be an enormous backfiring effect, a bit like Gary Lineker, if the government, you know, if the police arrest them. Last time, police arrested doctors, you know, for an XR demonstration, there were police in tears, right? We don't do that sort of thing in this country. We don't arrest nurses. So now, the think, reason you, so why... You, if you were to offer advice to the RCN, it would be to dress up in your gear, go down Westminster... I wouldn't offer... Sit this down. This is the whole point. I wouldn't offer advice to the union 
because the people I, who would be in the room are people who are structurally opposed to processes that are going to lead to success because they're in a bureaucratic reformist paradigm. And that's why, that's my analysis. I'm not making any, you know, ultimate moral judgments on it, but that's my analysis of what's happened over the last six months is that the social movements have not found the leadership and the organisational core to engage in mass civil resistance, which could have happened and maybe still could happen because of the cost of living crisis. So do you think they'll fail then, generally, because of th these limitations? Yes, because they, they, are, f they are caught in a, ca a neoliberal cage. The left neoliberal paradigm is, number one, we always fail, so it's always miserableist. <laughs> and number two, you're engaging tactics which have been proved to be, you know, at best mod. Well, they know. go on strike as well. I mean, strikes do work. I know strikes do work. If they were just doing the demos, I'd agree with you. Don't, but there are the strikes as well. It's, I'm making a general strategic point, mm. right? Obviously, strikes work. But we're, we're, we're heading into a period of massive social stress, you yeah. know, partially because of the neoliberal system, which we, everyone knows about who's listening to this, and partially because of the collapse of the weather systems, okay? So what, what, what we have to do is prepare now for the fluidity that's going to come through that social stress. People are going to be looking for an authentic meaning system. And if the left doesn't provide that meaning system, they'll find that meaning system oh, no, totally, in the populist right. I totally agree with you. So but this, is, totally this, this is my challenge to you, you know, my central challenge to you, you know, all due respect and everything, right? in this interview to Navarro and to the intellectual left more generally is I'm not anti-intellectual, don't get me wrong, right? I read loads of books. You're doing a PhD? Yeah, so I was doing a PhD and stuff. So I know lots of literatures, but we have to focus on March 2023 with 5,000 people watching this video. We have to fi start think intellectually think about the here and now with us and what we're going to do. That's what being an organic intellectual in the Gramscian sense means, right? You're in the factory, you're organising the workers about what's going to happen in a month, right? You're not hypothesising about, you know, the invasion of Ethiopia. <laughs> Can I ask you a final question? Yeah. Because you were in prison for 105 days. Mm. Did it change you at all? Yes, I think it did, actually. Yeah. It's made me a lot more confident. <laughs> really? <laughs> because the, the, with, with this stuff which you spoke about earlier, the process is the punishment, right? Even if they never actually, this doesn't go to court, if the CPS drops charges, et cetera, having a tag on you for a year, going in prison for 105 days, the stress and the anxiety is the punishment. That's the point. It's like very Kafkaesque. But you're saying that didn't work. No, because, because this is a problem with the vulnerability fetish of the left. It's like an exaggeration of victimhood, right? It's what what's happened is it's horrible being a victim, right? It's horrible being locked up, you know, for weeks in prison, and getting let out once every five days. It's objectively horrible. No one's doubting that. No one's doubting the reality of the being victims, right? And note, and the empirical record shows that the experience of oppression can and does create confidence, confidence to actually resist. So there's two different dynamics going on. What oppression does is creates, you know, despair, desolation, and all the associated aspects of it. And it creates empowerment and rage and maturity and resilience. And those two processes happen at the same time. It's actually quite complicated you know, in the literature to work out why that is the case and how the di how you can emphasise one more than the other. I mean, obviously, there's elements of support and there's elements of ideological sort of certainty when you go into mm. a space of oppression, right? But what we need to understand, what we need to understand, is that we have to move away from the fetishization of the victim narrative, right? I'm not fetishizing. I mean, going to prison is a serious is a serious thing. It's a serious thing, but this. This, this, this is another crucial transition. The left has to transition to a praxis, but it also has to, tr it also has to transition into a joyfulness about what it means to resist. It's good, right? 
it's good to resist because it makes you feel like you're actually doing something. <laughs> See what I mean? Mm. You're not just sitting there feeling depressed in your bed set. You're out on the streets and you're doing something. You're with other people and you're being, that's what being human is about, is sociability, right? And what's, what's instructive about being in prison is to make a, make a visceral connection with the reality of what oppression looks like, particularly for people that, you know, aren't from the working class and all that business, you know. So I'm not, I'm not saying, therefore, Aaron, go to prison to find out what oppression looks no, like. No, right? no, I know you're saying that. What I'm saying is, is let's have a more mature, historically informed discussion about what resistance involves. Sure. I suppose, just quickly, police do what they do to people like you precisely because it works. State intimidation, incarceration, it's effective. No, 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 no. You no. don't think so? No, it's effective and it's ineffective, right? So we've got to get away from Newtonian, you know, simple causal chains. Right, we live in a complex social system and the human brain is a complex system. So when things happen, you get a variety of different effects. And one of the key reasons why social change works is the indeterminacy of the oppressive strategy. You understand what that means? Very clear, you right? it very well. What, what, when the oppressor engages in repression, he's shaking a dice. It can work, or it can backfire and you can be out of power in a week. You know, I mean, I read, I'd read lots in prison, right? So just finish, maybe finish with this, like, in 1830, there was a revolution in France. And maybe you know how it worked, right? So it was a big banquet or 5,000 people in this banquet because they could only have banquets because they couldn't have political meetings because they'd end up in prison. So people were doing toasts and they're being, going, bring down the government, you know. But it's only a toast. So it's like, what we call a below the arrest line like action. The government overstepped itself and it oppressed the people who created the banquet and said, you can't have that banquet, which was so ridiculous. It was a bit like what just happened with Gary Lindick. It happens 101 times, right, in the literature. And all the people who are having the banquet thought, fuck that, we're going to have a demonstration. And because it was 1830 in France, some of the people were shot. And the following day, like, Five, ten thousand 10,000 people came on the street, part of the army defected. And within a week, the monarch abdicated and he was fleeing off to England, right? It was called the Five Glorious Days. In other words, like, when, when the Tory government decides to put Roger Hallam in prison, right? He's shaking a dice. Because when, when, I, go, when I go to get my court case dismissed, right? Maybe I'll go on hunger strike. They don't know, do they? And maybe I will, maybe I won't. So the, the, the strategic, the strategic like focus here is not speculating on whether the reaction of the oppressor is going to be effective or not. What we need to focus on is maximizing the rolls of the dice we put the oppressor in. You see what I mean? The number of confrontations where it backfires and you get 100,000 people in the streets for London. That's, that's the practical strategy for us. Roger Hallam, I think that's a great place to finish it on. Thank you so much for coming on Downstream. Are there any uh, final thoughts you want to leave our audience with? Yes, so as you've noticed in this video, I've had an agenda because I don't just go to the interviews to have a nice chat. So the agenda is, is that the audience is being invited to a Zoom call, which will happen in about seven to 10 days where they can find out more about civil resistance and join thousands of people on the street this April who will be taking, you know, slow marches around London um, in order to force the government to take action. And I'm inviting you, Aaron, to come along to that meeting and to lead the march. Lead the march? I don't think that's, I think it was very unwise. So are you on Twitter? Yes. You're on Twitter? Yeah. We'll direct people, I think, through the link in the, a link in the description yeah. there and they can f yeah. see you on Twitter and they'll be able to find that link. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to you when you're doing your videos and when you're choosing your vid videos to do is, make, is to have that pathway to action. That's the single most important thing I'm saying in this video is you have to create pathways to action at a time of emergency. That's what needs to happen in order to bring about the changes we want. I know it's real and boring, but that's so important.